team. We're glad to have everybody here. Uh, this panel session is Life in the Trenches, War Stories from Entrepreneurs. Uh, with a, a lot of different ways out there to get your funding, uh, you know, it's very hard to know what's the right way for you to get it and really what are your various avenues you have out there. How do you, how do you navigate all the, the different things that are involved in funding? So today with our panel, we hope to shed a little light on that. Uh, we've got a great panel who's going to talk about some of their stories when it comes to funding and tell you some of the do's that they've learned along the way and hopefully tell you some of the don'ts they've learned along the way. So uh, one of the things, let's, we'd like to get an idea of what we have out in the audience. Can you raise your hand if you're looking for funding? All right. Can you raise your hand if you have money to lend? All right, so the first one of the first things that we're probably going to have to talk about is where do you find the funders, right? So, uh, uh, here. <laughs> so let me just uh, introduce our panelists. I'll start uh, with David Fuhrer. Uh, David is the president of Pure Launcher. Uh, he has uh, experience from a wide range of funding, one being uh, winning it at competitions. Last year, David was the winner of the pitch competition at age 13, so he's welcome back for that as well. Uh, Pure Launch, or just a little bit about them, is a, a company that creates partnerships with support communities to complement the mission of the support community and, and provide a free resource to people who are fighting diseases. Uh, basically, it's a personalized clinical trial matching service. Uh, prior to core funding, I mean the core launcher, David spent 10 years developing uh, new products for other small companies like Pfizer and General Electric and Dow. That's so, okay. yeah. Uh, next to me is Mark Stanzak. He's a uh, founding partner with uh, Global ET. Uh, Mark's funding comes from uh, government contracts, SDIR funding. Uh, Global ET is uh, involved in the development of electronic modules for the military and automotive applications. Uh, like I said, he's worked with uh, the U.S. Army TARDEC through the Small Business Innovation Research Program uh, and has led efforts to transition that SDIR technology into the marketplace. Uh, he's also a veteran on several paths, which is dear to my heart uh, as well. Uh, and next, uh, we have Greg Hammerman. He's the co-founder of Larky. Greg has an interesting story. He's been involved with several uh, startups over the, over the years, uh, and a lot of variety of funding, actually. Uh, Larky, I believe, is primarily angel funding. Is that correct? There's some VC in there. Some VC in there as well. Uh, Larky was founded to help consumers get all the perks they deserve. I love that, that phrase right there, very catchy. Uh, the company works closely with employers and organizations to develop perk programs, make sure they drive the engagement of those programs and the utilization of them. Prior to Larky, Greg founded uh, Tech Street, which was uh, helped engineers efficiently manage their, their technical information. Uh, Tech Street itself was purchased by Thompson and Warriors, right? That's right. And then finally, Jan Ness is the CEO of Online Tech. And uh, Jan's also had an extensive experience with a lot of different type of funding. Uh, I think most recently with, with uh, Online Tech, it's been customer funding. Would that be? No, we uh, uh, actually raised uh, about 20 million less. Okay. Uh, four quarter that was one of the earlier companies with, with uh, uh, customer. one of our customers up through that. Up through that. Oh, okay. Uh, Jan has more than 25 years experience launching and managing high-tech companies from startup to scaling up the companies as well. He was recently a finalist with uh, Ernst & Young on the Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, in 2003, Jan led a group of investors to acquire online tech and, and since then they've taken that and, and averaged over 30% annual growth since then. So very dramatic growth and amazing to keep it sustained for that long. Prior to online tech, uh, he's the co-founder of Company Crafters and Workwell Health and Safety Systems, uh, which was the latter of which was acquired by Liberty Mutual. Uh, and then finally, myself, my name is Eric Sosanko. I'm a shareholder with the law firm of Brinks, Gilson & Leone. I'm a patent and trademark attorney by nature. I've been practicing patent law, trademark law for the last 24 years out of Ann Arbor. Uh, I've been representing startups and small companies all the way through my entire career. So uh, with that, um, I wanted to just start off uh, with a couple of things. We're videotaping today, and a lot of these uh, sessions do get watched pretty regularly. So if you have questions, we'd really like for you to use the mic to do your pass it around, depending on what everybody's more comfortable with. But I don't want walking up to the mic to stifle questions coming from anybody out there. We really want this to be 
your panel session and not our panel session. The idea is to really get the information that you want to get that out, not the information that we want to, to get out. So uh, if you have a question, please walk up there, otherwise we'll, we'll start passing around. Uh, but if you do speak without that microphone, then I'm gonna ask that we'll just repeat the question and whoever wants to answer can go ahead. So I just wanna start off with the very, very basic because I'm not sure where we're all at on a funding standpoint. And, and just talk briefly, uh, least just let everybody go through their story, okay? It, it, I think that's gonna give us some ideas of the funding out there because they're all, all over the place where you've been with funding. So why don't we just start with Mark and work our way down. Hi, um, I'm Mark Stanzak. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. This is um, an interesting and exciting um, conference. I've never been to this conference, um, and, and yet I've been an entrepreneur for um, 18 years officially. I, I started my career um, about 22, 23 years ago at uh, Chrysler Corporation. I was um, a design engineer, software design engineer for uh, embedded electronic modules. Uh, felt I was there for uh, five years, and um, as I was there, I had a, an ongoing uh, yearning to do something on my own uh, and, and with a business partner. So uh, myself and, and my business partner of today um, ventured out on our own and just bootstrapped it initially. Uh, Mid-90s to um, the early 2000s, we did a lot of work for automotive tier one companies. We were work for hire, um, consulting services for electronic modules, hardware and software development. Uh, in the early 2000s, the 2002 timeframe, uh, we got involved with the SBIR program based on some work that we were doing uh, for the automotive sector. The SBIR program is the Small Business Innovation Research Program. It's, um, it's essentially a grant, but the way that the, uh, the DOD runs that program, it's, it's actually a contract. Um, what the business, what the small business does is they look at topic needs and they respond with a proposal uh, and then it's a, a competition from there. Uh, you're, you typically, um, for any given topic, there are 30 to 100 responders, uh, and if your proposal is a sound proposal and it meets the need of the topic, and where those particular engineers want to go, they, they uh, choose that topic. The SBIR program is made up of uh, a few different phases. Um, and for us, it's been, a, it's been an excellent, excellent program to be involved with, and we can get into more specifics about it uh, if there are questions about that. I don't want to take up too much time, um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, pass the mic. <coughs> okay, uh, hi everybody, I'm Dave Fuhrer. I left a 10-year corporate consulting career in October of 12. <coughs> this is about a year and a half for me as an early stage entrepreneur. Uh, ACE was a turning point for us last year to get up and do the pitch competition and it put us on the radar, so that was nice. Uh, we raised this past year 1.3 million, a uh, combination of uh, Founders Equity, so my partner put in a large chunk. Uh, we got an angel round and then we did the Michigan pre-seed match. Um, and I think uh, as Eric and I were prepping for this uh, yesterday chatting, I got some great advice early on in the funding process uh, of our mentors at Cure Launcher said, um, right money, right time. And that's something I never forgot. There's actually a ton of resources in Michigan. Uh, it's almost sort of overwhelming when you start to go out and look at funding opportunities, uh, state programs, private programs. Uh, and so it was important for us to select what was the right fit for us and then to really focus our efforts on making sure we created relationships and partnered in the right place. So I uh, look forward to talking about any specific questions, but you know, the main theme that I want to stress is you know, know what you're all about and who you partner with, because uh, you're in it together for the long run. Uh, you really become partners and want to mutually succeed with each other. So it's kind of a quick background on us getting into it. Yeah, what's up to me? So I'm gonna uh, focus on fundraising experience I've had, not so much about what the businesses did, but how we raised money. So the first business that we raised money for was right out of college. We got friends and family money. We didn't have a lot of friends, and so it was 18,000 bucks total to start the thing. And from there, we really grew from customers. So we had customer funding until we got to a certain point. 
and then we were able to attract some angel funding and then some actual strategic investment. And the big lesson I learned during that one was as fast as we could get self-sufficient, it put us in a great position because then as these other investors came to the table, we could make the right decision about, hey, this is the right partner, we don't absolutely need the money to live on. So that was sort of experience one. Experience two, I had a mobile app developed, I'm not a coder, but I had an idea for an app. That was my own version of crowdfunding. I called a bunch of friends and family and said, hey, do you want to put in 500 bucks? I'll share some revenues with you guys. And we raised like 10, 12,000 bucks. Ended up selling the app to a large company and everybody made some money on that. But I think the lesson I learned there was I knew that that was sort of a one and done. We were going to raise money, build this thing, and it was either going to go or it wasn't going to go, but it wasn't like a five-year project. And then the third company that I'm involved with now, Larky, we did a very different approach. We actually went to uh, venture capital and to angel investors, and we knew that it was going to be multiple funding to get where we needed to go. And so in that case, we worked with finding the best partners we could to make sure that they understood what our long-term vision was, and they would be there along the way and support us along the way. So those are my three different things. Um, so, uh, raise money from all kinds of different places, so, uh, run companies with no money, uh, and uh, sweat, you know, growing companies on sweat equity uh, in the 80s and 90s, before there was really much structured capital here in Michigan at all. And uh, I've used my own money, which is the scariest of all, and um, still do. Uh, <clears throat> 2003, I've done a couple of deals, and but 2003, small company, online technologies corporation, came for sale. I'm doing about half a million dollars a year in business. And so um, my mentor, actually, a guy who had been kind of coaching me for 20, 30 years of my life, he and I uh, wrote a check about the company and um, uh, basically financed it uh, using uh, the business model, which I think is something people forget. Uh, Amazon has a uh, negative working, however you describe it financially, but they collect millions and millions and millions of dollars every day. They don't have to pay their vendors for 90 days. And so, you know, we do things like we're a recurring revenue business, right? So I bill you for a service, and we said, all right, I'm going to bill, change my model, so I bill you like uh, Comcast does for the month before you get your service. And so that created a whole two months worth of cash flow. So we used our business model, we used our customers, we used banks, we used Dell, we used all kinds of places. But ultimately, and at the end of last year, we went to market, uh, we were very, very profitable. That is the only investment to raise money, I believe, figure it out until you're profitable. We went to market, uh, had 11 term sheets, private equity firms, wealthy families, uh, strategic uh, acquirers. We ended up uh, raising 18 million from a very uh, wealthy family out of the in the United States, doesn't matter who they are. Uh, it's been a great, great ride. But my favorite phrase about raising money, and uh, you have to take this to heart, I didn't make it up, it's, it's uh, too clever for me to make it up, but basically it's a great entrepreneur, uh, never pays for anything they can lease, never buy something you can lease, never lease something you can rent, never rent something you can't get for free, never take something for free you can't get somebody else to pay you to take. And it's actually that last one. That last one that defines an entrepreneur. Uh, one of my favorite examples is Warren Buffett makes money with a shareholder meeting. I, I, I definitely like that saying. <laughs> um, I, I just want to start with the first question off the bat. We talked about, okay, where you're at, very early stage. Where do you go to look for funding? I mean, this is one of the places you. Well, when you guys were first going out, you were first, you know, your first time you had, you know, you were 18 months, Dave, as an entrepreneur now, when you, when you resigned, when you left the company, what did you do? Where did you go? Where did you go look? How did you find out even where to look? Well, I think uh, I've heard it a couple times, actually, and it's probably the best advice I ever got was uh, don't really look seriously too early. Uh, if you start going out for money, money, you know, right out of the gate, you're not tight enough yet. You don't know what money is the right partner to go out for or go out with. And so uh, we actually, when we started launching Pure Launcher, uh, started doing a lot of the state programs like the Spark Bootcamp program, you know, the business model construction programs where we really figured out, like you're saying, what are we all about um, and how are we going to attract the right people that believe in our business. So just getting in that community sort of opens doors. You know, it's, it's 
I'll probably struggle to articulate this well, but getting funded isn't the end point, it's not even the middle point, it's a point on a really long continuum. And you have to do a lot of things right to get to that point, and then you've got to do a lot of things right after that point. Um, and so, you know, we, we learned and learned how to refine our business early on. And then that was my long-winded way of saying um, the state has some really great programs you can start to evaluate. Um, and we had some good mentors that helped us figure out which programs were the right ones for us. Um, and really be choosy about it. We actually, uh, mid-year, turned down a million-dollar term sheet. And so as an early stage company, nine months out of the gate, that's a hard thing to do, uh, especially when you're clawing for every dollar to grow your business. Um, but long term, it just wasn't the right fit for us. Uh, and so we went in a different direction, uh, made, a, I think, a better funding um, decision, a more strategic funding decision three months later. Uh, and now we're really equipped for some great growth. So that kind of get at the what and how we're out of the gate. Uh, what about uh, Greg Young? What about an uh, early start on you? How did you make a determination where to go look for for funding? Uh, my favorite funding is non dilutive So customers, I think, is revenue is the best source of funding there is. Period. Um, so not all businesses can do this. I mean, biotech is a good example of a business you can't really sell the drug to somebody before you have it. Um, <laughs> and it's hard to get from the day you. Promise that you're going to develop it, but you can do that in a lot of other cases. And if you can't convince anybody in your target market to take a bet on you, and they're going to get the value of the offering, I think you're, you, you know, I think you need to go back and talk to customers more before you talk to investors. I would really like to see customer source of um, revenue, and then the second source, I would like to see you. The customer source is a great source, and I was, when we were just starting Larky, we were looking for beta customers, and we were saying, oh, you know, we'll give them free services if they'll give us feedback on the product, and we'll help develop the product, and a very smart entrepreneur said, don't do that. It's not a proof point. The proof point is, is someone going to pay you for this thing? He said, I, he was running a company that was doing really well, and he said, when he was looking for beta customers, he said, I'll give them a reduced rate, or I'll give them something, but he'd look him in the eye and say, I can't give this to you for free, because what I need to prove to myself and sort of the world is this has value to you. And I thought it was a really powerful thing, and it sort of changed how we thought about getting funding from customers. The other, you know, it doesn't always work this way, but I've been fortunate that I've been around Ann Arbor. I came for school in 1990, so I've been around town for 20 years, and I just got to know a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts, and a smart mentor I worked with once had this sort of phrase, always meet, if someone wants to grab lunch, how much? It's very cliche, and everybody always talks about it, but I found when we were raising money, there were several people who were willing to be angels and sort of jumped in that I had always counted on their experience and their wisdom but never thought I'd be asking them for money, but they knew me over a long period of time. And when I said, I'm really excited about this, this is what I want to do, they said, well, I want to be a part of that too. So I never did it as a, someday I'll ask these guys for money, I did it because I thought they were input, but it all worked out a lot. I'd like to uh, interject as well. Um, I heard the word community. Uh, for us, um, community has been a, a, a big thing. We, we would gravitate towards consortiums that were um, that were in the areas that we were in, electronic modules for transportation systems, and we got involved with ITS Michigan uh, way back in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, and we found opportunities um, by doing that type of networking. We did a lot of cold calling, and it was all customers and value to their company value to our customers and one of the things that we found out was was uh, real early on was doing a good job for your customer and adding value to your customer um, actually spawned new business it was the easiest way to get new business we would always love to hear if a, if a point of contact for us was leaving a company and going to another company we were, we were going to have another company customer it was, it was a great way to um, to, uh, to find opportunity and, and, to, uh, and to get that really funding for us. Dave, you made the statement about um, not looking for funding too early. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I mean, it's one of those, those, those fuzzy questions. Yeah. Those, how do you know when it's too early? I can you point it on the patent side. There's always a question, are you patenting too early? Yeah. That's not what this panel is about, that could be another panel at another time. But how, how, do, you, how do you quantify whether or not you're, you're going for funding too early? Let me steal that one. Um, I'll take two. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, so you sort of threw me a tough one on that one. Uh, how do you define not going too early? Um, I guess everything we do in our business, we have to stop and assess what the purpose is for doing it. You, know, you kind of get caught up as an entrepreneur doing a lot of things just to keep balls moving and feel like you're being active. Um, and we've had to learn how to really slow down and understand the purpose in every step or every action we took. Um, as an early entrepreneur, I would encourage, ever encourage everybody to really ask yourself why you're going out for funding. Is it to prove that you have something already? Um, I think you hit on that really well. If you haven't really already proven it, uh, I don't know that you're at a good point to go out and raise funding um, because you're going to try to learn as you're getting funding in the door. That's a tough thing to do. Um, I, you know, I go back to a lot of the state programs to really help us figure out what our business model is. Will customers really pay for it? Not just be interested, but really pay for it. What kind of value do you generate for them as well as for you? Uh, those are all things that you know any smart investor will really, really want early. Um, and I think you know you'll find out if you go out too early, you don't have the right answers for that, or you don't have enough information to answer that. Um, and so that's why it's really important to get to the point where you can answer them <coughs> confidently internally. What are we going to use this money for to really generate value and return for our investors and for the customers who give us their cash? Um, rushing out to investing is not a wise process, um, and so it's really the labor and how you evaluate what, how, when. Who those investing partners are. Can I speak to that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, really age old and complicated question. Really good answer, by the way. But um, having been an angel investor and consulting for VCs, uh, if you flip the coin and ask, when do they want to invest? At what stage do they want to invest? What they want to do is they want it, that all you need now is the Everything else, the proof of concept is done. You've got your first customers. All I need, so the day they write the check, stuff happens that could have never happened before. So if you can go enough, if you can prove your next proof of concept, if you can get your business to the next stage without the money at all, any 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 meaningful progress at all without money, then you're, you, 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 they're going to want to wait. Bring anything. Anything to add to that? Just thinking a little bit about the uh, the difference of positioning when you're at a stage where you the money is hopeful to your growth, but not absolutely required for your growth. So we were fortunate to be in that position once, and we've been in the opposite position where you've got to need the money, otherwise the doors are going to close, and that's a horrible position to be in. And investors sense that and it's not a really compelling value to them. Of we're going to keep you open and maybe push things forward. We had a much more successful time. We said. We're doing this, we're growing at this rate, we've got a lot of customers, they're happy to do it. And if I had advice to folks, if you get to that point where you can make sure that you're not up against a wall, you're not taking terms that you don't want to take, you're taking a deal that makes sense all around, because you think it's gonna help grow the business, but not because you absolutely have to take the deal. Uh, real quick as well, um, I think uh, again, the customer base, the reputation, and the, um, and the business structure for us has been important. Uh, when we first looked at the SBIR program, we, we looked at it, we were in business maybe six months, and we looked at what it would take to pull off even just a proposal, and we just weren't equipped to do it. So we had to, we had to just not do it. And then when we looked at it again uh, in 2002, we felt a lot more equipped. We dedicated a person to actually learning about it in our company and locked them away for a month in a, in a closet and had them write a proposal, a couple proposals. So um, again, timing was, was wrong the first time, but it was right the second time. We, we talked about trying to figure out when to do it. Um, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure if it was John or Craig when we were talking last week. You, you made the statement that one thing that, that uh, any inventor, any entrepreneur when they're seeking funding needs to realize is that your idea is not nearly as interesting to the funder as it is to you. So that really brings me to the question, you know, you have to know who your funders are. What are some of the things for the various types of funders that they may want to see differently from each other? So what should you know before you approach that funder? Oh, sorry, the mic's in front of me, so hey, I'm that. 
<coughs> so one of the lessons I've learned in the years is when we were talking to institutional investors, venture capital, you know, they're in a business, they've raised money from their investors, and it's their job to employ and produce returns on that. But they have different stages they're in in their business. So sometimes they've just raised money, and now they're looking to invest. Sometimes they raised money 10 years ago, and they're helping their investors, but they're not really active investors. And I've wasted far too much time with people who really weren't ready to invest and weren't very upfront about that. And so the more you know about where they are in their life cycle, and I think that goes for all kinds of different potential funding sources. If it's a, if it's an angel investor, what are they looking to accomplish? Do they have certain goals they've set out that they're gonna make two investments a year and they've already made two investments? The more you know about what the other people are looking for and what they're trying to gain. I, I know funding sources in Michigan, unfortunately I can't like give out names or phone numbers, but that just want to try to like make business succeed. They're sort of sprinkling around cash. Their motives are not exactly the same as what you would think, that they want to grow the next Google. They're just sort of, I think this will help the environment if we sprinkle this around. But knowing as much as you can about folks and understanding where they're coming from is essential. Uh, yeah, I would echo that. I mean, just like a customer, you want to know everything you can you know, about them. <clears throat> one, one technique I would really strongly suggest is, somebody mentioned earlier, you know, you've know, got to know where you are in the in investment stage and where that investor likes to invest. Investors tend to, you know, industry, size, stage, size of gamble. If, if you're gonna need $100 million to get something, make something successful, which some deals do, you know, don't, don't start going to angel investors at, at the start because they, you know, unless it's, you know, Bill Gates kind of an angel investors. And you, know, so you need to know, and I think one technique I, I, I would really encourage you to do is, before you get anywhere near meeting with an investor, find out who their investments are now and call, get in touch with their portfolio CEOs and ask what it's like to have them as an investor, what do they care about, what's important to them, what are the kinds of questions they ask, what value do they provide. Two things will happen, you'll learn and that word will get back to that investor because not a lot of entrepreneurs do that. They don't bet their investors. Mark, anything to add to this? Yeah, so um, that inspired some great thoughts. Um, so the, the thing you don't think think about, or at least for, you know, first time through entrepreneurs don't think about, is time is probably one of your most precious commodities. <laughs> um, and uh, going through a funding round is an all-consuming process. And so you're not really growing your business or even cultivating your business when you're going out for funding because you have to be all in at that funding round. Um, and when you look back on what you've done, you looked at what went well and what didn't go well, and where you could have probably saved some time or made smarter decisions. Um, but, uh, and I think, um, I see John back here, we come out of a market research background. You know, it's always what can you test and learn before you go out and commit resources to doing that. And by doing exactly what you guys are talking about, which is, you know, who are they, what do they care about, how do they fit with me, learning as much as you can, you save amounts of time that may have otherwise drained you or not enabled you to go out and raise the right money. So um, being smart and really strategic um, might seem tough when you're hungry for money or trying to start a business, but it's probably the biggest return you'll ever get in terms of your time invested to do it. So great points, guys. And it's, it sounds like uh, a lot of the comments are know your funder, I would say know your customers, and, uh, and timing's important there too. So just echoing what everybody's saying here, um, but then relating it to to, uh, to cut, it almost seems like the same problem, the same jigsaw puzzle. Um, knowing your funder, knowing your customer. Other than having the funder bring money to the table to you, what do you look for from your funder? Because someone once said that you know, said that it's, it's it's not you're not just looking for somebody who's giving you money. You're looking for something much more. It might have been Jan who said that. Already. What else are you looking for from your investor? I would start with uh, <clears throat> what kind of relationship do you want to have with that investor? I mean, uh, my prior investor in this deal, who will be cashed out, uh, he was uh, he was very passive, and he was like he was more like a cheerleader investor, and I like that. That's not always so good. I, I, I like investors that are unchallenging, hold you accountable. Uh, help you think about your strategy, certainly have some Rolodex contacts for you, maybe on the customer. Any, any, any investor that can help you drive revenue, uh, that's, that's good value. Um, but you know, it, you have to be a little careful with the dynamic. You get, you get three people like me in a room all invested in your company, and 
you, you're going to have you, you got to manage uh, a lot of personality at once and um, somebody said in the other room I think it was Stu Nelson you get three or five angels that are pretty you know pretty gung ho um, all want to get involved uh, you may end up spending an awful lot of time managing your shareholders and that's not really you know, because remember, especially angel investors, they, 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 some of them invest because they want to be involved. And you've got to recognize what kind of relationship that, that is going to be and understand the dynamic of the, of the collection of investors. Or, um, you know, you, we have one or two of them loaded sideways and they'll take all the rest of them with, with, with them. That, that's, that's a tough situation to be in. We, uh, we look for um, the, the opportunity. Uh, so as we're looking at SBIR topics, we, we try to match it up with our current offerings and we try to, try to find uh, opportunities that'll uh, fit with where we are going as a, as a company. Uh, and, and really in the end, we're looking for, for uh, product opportunities and, and the opportunity to commercialize that SBIR technology. So uh, the questions we usually ask are, how does it how does it match what we're doing? How does it match? How does that particular opportunity match our core values as a company? Um, yeah, you know, I think we were fortunate in that we had a formal advisory board um, early on, um, and I can't um, echo the importance of that enough um, because you know if there are people you trust, it's a great set of insights or source of inputs. Um, that really help you guide through that process, and we actually brought one of those advisors on um, to our board of director, directors officially last year. Um, but um, when we did our second raise, it was strategic in that the person believed in what we did, the head of the angel fund, um, and personally wanted to get involved and support it. Um, and I, you know, I, there's always that gentle balance of are they going to take a lot of time to be really involved, or are they going to support what we're doing? Um, and we just had a good feel about it. So. You know, there's a lot to be said for gut, but there's a lot to be said for you know, really doing your homework and making sure you hold the line and what you're doing. As you're having your conversations with the funder, uh, one of the questions that comes through everyone's mind is, how much do I have to disclose? How do you how do you balance what the funder wants to hear versus what you're willing to tell? Is there any guidance that you can provide? Especially if you, if you take it to the different sources, it doesn't vary by source of funding. So I was got a phone that said, doesn't matter, tell them everything. But I, I, just to be straight, I come from a background, I'm not talking about patents, I'm not talking about intellectual property. My business is intended to be, hey, I've got this goofy idea, I think there could be a business here. And I did start out being very fearful of, what if I tell people that they can get all the standards and technical engineering standards stuff they need in one place, everyone's going to steal this idea. That was my first business. The reality of how this all plays out or has for me is what I talk about and then how things evolve and change and what we learn when we're really in the market and customers out there, it's never the same. And people, I've yet to have the experience where if someone says, hey, that's great, I'm going to take it and run with it. The other thing to keep in mind is the investors, if they're angel investors or if it's a state program or if it's a venture capital or someone else in the community, odds are that they're not in the same position as you are to be starting a business, I don't think I've heard of venture capital people in the Midwest and say, I'm going to quit my VC job and take his idea and run with it. They, you know, they're in a different business sort of by nature. Um, there is, I think it's Steve Blank, one of the famous sort of entrepreneurial authors that said, try it. You know, take, don't take your best idea because you're protected with that. Take your third and fourth ideas and call the company that you think might steal it and tell them the idea and see if they'll take it and you'll learn. It won't go anywhere. They won't take it. It's too much bureaucracy. So all this fear that a lot of people have about I better not tell anyone. It, it just isn't going to work. It's sort of the last piece of this, and I'll give other people there. I was talking to an entrepreneur yesterday who wanted me to sign an NDA, and it was introduced to a friend. He said, hey, you know, I'd love to share with you my idea to sign an NDA. And I just flat out said, I can't. I won't. Not because I'm going to steal your idea, but because I'm involved, and I talk to a lot of different people all the time, and there's no way I'm going to put myself at any sort of legal risk that something I'm already involved with conflicts with the thing you might tell me about. And so I find that reaction from a lot of people. Venture capital people I talk to, I ask to sign in these. They won't, very few will do it. Most people won't do it. So I guess my short advice all this is get over it. People aren't going to steal it. Have fun and go. Jan? Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm more where, where Greg is. But uh, I, I know there's some biotech guys that are, would, would definitely uh, disagree with me. And so there's some industries where there's different um, 
different styles. But uh, I mean, I think you're, look, uh, the greater risk is they're going to think your idea sucks, but they're not going to steal it. I mean, that's the truth. If you tell your idea to 100 people and 100 investors, whatever, and 80 of them aren't going to think it's going to be good, that's your risk. And so, you know, the question to me is, you know, it's great. Well, okay, tell half the people because you're afraid that they're going to steal it. You just, you just doubled your risk of trying to raise money. You have to share the idea with people. I mean, you're going to have to do that. Second of all, uh, yeah, I would never sign an NDA if somebody asked me, could I share a business idea with you? That's, that's kind of absurd. But, but professional, you know, venture capitalists, private equity guys, professional, and certainly the state, they don't steal ideas. I mean, if they stole one idea, they would never get another deal. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't happen. And an idea by itself, this is why a UM professor has, who has a patent on something, they form a company, they raise 20, 30, 50 million dollars, he, he owns one or two percent at the end of the day. That's what the value of the, of the idea at day one is. It's not this great valuable thing. It's not as it's not as great as you think. That's the first thing to, to recognize. So I'm, I'm with Greg. I'm uh, you know, free, free, free to share. And you'll probably the more you share, the more your idea will get better. And you need it to. Oh, we're just the opposite, but there's not a meeting that I go into that there isn't an NDA put in front of me or I put an NDA in front of somebody. Uh, and the ideas flow from there typically, but um, you know we're um, you know we're in a line of business where it's where it's um, accepted that you'll have a non-disclosure agreement. You have to read them because there's sometimes language in there that you just you don't sign. But there are usually pretty standard non-disclosure agreements that um, that are acceptable, and, um, and that if that's the barrier to the open discussion, we have zero problems signing an NDA. All right. So we've gone through that. That we've got an offer on the table now. How do you decide what's a good offer? I don't want to get to the discussion of when you turn it down. I want to say that for a follow-up question, but uh, what, what's the hallmarks to you of what a good offer is? What's red flags that that's maybe not a good offer? Um, and so I'll jump out of the gate on this one. Uh, the paper on the table is just the end of the long path to get to that point. And I think um, knowing if it's the right off, uh, offer or not is how you to the company and the investor got to that point together. So was there good discussion around what are we really going to do? Is there good discussion around how we're going to handle issues? A clear understanding of what you're all about. You know, if you don't have all those things vetted out before you get to that offer stage, I would say that's an immediate red flag. Um, that you don't know what you're getting into and that almost always goes bad. Uh, I think in terms of what you share, that's where transparency is really important. Um, and a lot of our funding round was sort of not the typical, you know, stand and pitch kind of thing. It was really trying to court somebody and figure out what they cared about and what they wanted to accomplish. And there's all different scenarios. So, you know, sometimes it's they're making a conscious investment because it's something they believe in. Sometimes it's, you know, a straight line return they're looking for. Uh, but you have to know all those things. Uh, and offer in and of itself isn't good or bad when you sit down at the table to sign. It's, you know, how does it fit you and what the investor wants to get out of it. Yeah, so we had we had a big problem with that last year. We had we went to market. We were, we were, we were one of the darlings of the industry, the analysts, and um, we had 11 term sheets from all over across the country. And uh, it's a great position to be in. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it wasn't necessarily the deal that said that we wanted. It was the uh, partner. And uh, the reason why we were able to, to pick that pretty quickly is because we spent an awful lot of time at the beginning of the process, which is pretty exhausted. Uh, I mean, a lot of time uh, writing up what we really, really wanted, what was most important to us. And we felt that the more we knew about that, the faster we would recognize it when we saw it. So we actually had a lot of debate at the board level, uh, at the management team. Did we want to do a deal with a strategic buyer? Do we want to do a deal with a large private equity firm, a small private equity firm, one in our industry, one in our industry, a wealthy family? We, we, we need to do, we need about 30 to 50 million dollars. So this is not going to go to your typical half million dollar angels. These 
these are billion dollar families worth a lot of money. And we had a lot of conversation around what was most important to us. And if we hadn't had that, we would not have had any, any idea when we looked at these term sheets. We would have had to go back to that. Well, what, what are we looking for here? What do we like? What do we not like? So I think the number one way you know that at the end is you begin to work on it at the beginning. There's a good chance you're not going to get exactly what you want, but you should know what's important to you so that when you see it, you, you can act on it. That's a great point. I think aligned with what David was saying, for us, it's been a collaborative conversation along the way. There's never been a situation I've been involved where someone said, here's the term sheet, take it or leave it, which I would consider to be a big red flag. And I know that there are investment opportunities that have come up that way in, in the state and elsewhere. So for us, it's how's the dialogue gone from the start? When we first met this person, how did it go? There was an investor in my career very early on who I didn't understand all the terms. They were saying that they wanted certain provisions and I didn't know what it meant and I was sort of sheepish about it, but I told him and I said, you know, I, I don't really understand what you're talking about. He said, I'm sorry, you shouldn't. I've been doing this for 20 years and you, you, well, how would you know? Let me educate you a little bit. And then he sort of went on to say, here's why we like to put these things in our term sheet. Here's what we're trying to get at. And it helped build the collaboration. So we did together figure out what made sense for the business and to drive it forward. So I, you know, I'm always looking for this feeling of partnership before we get to the paper on the table. If you don't have that feeling of partnership, don't don't spend any more time with them. Move on. You got you, you got to pick the people, pick your partner first, and then do the deal. Don't do a deal and then pick your partner. Um, typically, uh, you know, when we see a, a contract come across our, our table, um, we, there's a lot of work that goes into even getting to that point. Um, the proposal stage. Um, and there's a relationship that we've built with customers or, or with the, within a, uh, a bigger client organization, a department. So you, you start to, again, just I'm echoing the same thing here. You get to know who you're about to work with and, um, and then reading the terms and the conditions and uh, um, doing your homework there before you, you enter into the agreement. Um, I mentioned just a little bit ago about turning down money. And I think Jan, Craig, and Dave, each of you have turned down some money that probably uh, people in this room would have liked to have had on the table and had a chance to accept. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to turn down money and what really triggered you uh, in that sense? What, what really made you say, no, this isn't right for us? I can kind of hit it on it, I think, a little bit uh, just previously. but. Sure. So uh, I mentioned earlier about what, what, what time, the timing to raise money, and um, I believe the right time to raise money is when, when you know exactly what to do with a whole bunch more audit, and, um, not not just to keep the business alive, but in our in our scenario. So in our business, you know, it's very metric driven, right? We open a data center, it costs about five million bucks to open it, and then it's an economic scarcity model. I got to spend, I got to get a fill, I got to get to profitability, right? And so we've done enough of them now that I have the model figured out. I know if I spend this much on a data center and I, and I spend this much on marketing in that market, hire this many salespeople, and, and do all of these exact things, I know how my ratios work, and I know when I'm going to be profitable. So I've got the model built, and now it's about get a bunch more money and go do, do them even faster now. We've proven it. And, um, you know, we, so I, I think, before we had really figured out those metrics, but we really couldn't use the money. I mean, we were not profitable yet. We were, we were still growing 30% a year. It was a very capital intensive business. It was very stressful on the whole team. Everybody was working really hard, underpaid, not enough budgets to do some of the stuff we were taking on and doing. And somebody came and offered us at a pretty healthy valuation, a seven figure check for a, a very sizable piece of the company. It was extremely tempting. We thought about all the things we could go do. But the one thing we realized we could not do, we couldn't, it wasn't just purely to accelerate. It was going to be, boy, with that money, we could put this infrastructure in place and that infrastructure. We could do the things that we knew we needed to do. But quite frankly, we could get those done anyway. It was just going to take a little longer. And in having to go through and do those, we were learning more about our model. Well, it was about a year ago when we know our model now. I know if I can, if I have a certain amount of capital and I put it into a market of a certain density, I know how that's going to turn out. So now is the time to go raise the money and pour as much money as we can into that formula. 
Uh, but until you figure out that, that formula, until you got that right, it's very tempting. And uh, we wanted to, man, the man, the management team, and everybody wanted to, but we said no. And the man was a good one. said no. My uh, turning down capital experience is a little bit different. That we were, it was my first company, Tech Street. We had raised some strategic investment, and we had a term sheet from a venture capital firm in Indiana to do a $6 million <coughs> investment in the company. And we had learned a lot of stuff. I wouldn't say we had it all nailed, but we, we knew what we were going to do money. But what was sort of happening in the world, this was late 90s, it was the internet bubble, and things were going public, and companies were being bought for ridiculous amounts of money, and sort of the vision of these investors, they were nice people, and we had a nice collaborative relationship, but it was, hey, if we do this, we can go really fast, we're probably going to exit pretty quickly to one of these big companies that would want to buy us. The economy started to turn, and it felt like the odds of that were decreasing and decreasing, and we were in the position then that we didn't really need the money. It would have accelerated things, it would have been nice, but we basically said, this doesn't make sense to us now, let's not do this deal with you guys, we'll just grow organically, and we did, and we weathered the storm of the economic downturn, that was in the late 90s, and we exited to Thomson Reuters shortly after, well, a couple years after that, actually, and it was the right decision for us at the time. It was more of a macro, you know, what was happening in the world economy that, that made us do it. Yeah, um, all, all good points. I think it goes, for me it goes back to one of the comments we started earlier with, with uh, right money, right time. Um, and I think, uh, I hope any, anyway, everybody that is going out to raise money is looking at it from a long view. You know, it's not just the round. Uh, this is a small state and a small industry and what you do sort of echoes for a long time. So uh, you better make sure that, you know, when you get to that point with somebody, you're both in alignment on what you're gonna do and how you're gonna play. And, um, so all those things are incredibly important. It's tough uh, early stage when you're hungry and trying to grow a business. Uh, but if your motivation is to grow a sustainable business and create a good reputation by how you do it, uh, it's important that you think about both sides of the table. Um, and I actually like that on the panel here, you're kind of getting both sides of it. You know, the early stage trying to grow, the later stage or, or the investor perspective. Um, but your reputation says a lot about what you do and how you respect the investor. So uh, don't treat that lightly. If you have an opportunity to, um, for an SBIR, contract or grant, don't turn that down. Find a way to do it. <laughs> because it, there, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity that comes from that. Um, so I, for us, um, the line of business that we're in, we, we have not turned down those types of opportunities. Now we may not pursue topics if they're not a good fit, but if we've gone through the, the process of pursuing a topic and putting a proposal together, um, we are in in that line of business and we we want to be involved with that okay at this point in time i'd like to open up for questions does anybody have any questions for the panel if you could uh you mind coming up to the mic thank you out there dedicated to helping you get through that process so organizations like PTAC um, if you're familiar with yeah. that term you can sit down with them for a few hours they'll get you through that process I, um, I remember doing it like years ago but okay. I don't know it took like a month of my time it's always <laughs> long <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to understand the government and then it was hell trying to bid on projects because you got like 10 other suppliers or what have you yeah. we never got anything I know that they say there's all this money that they have for small businesses, but I'm like, I don't know how we could compete. I mean, I was, you know, I was getting all these contracts. Where's this money going? Where's the $60 billion you got? First of all, I don't know where it's going. Some of it's going to us, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm getting better at it. I was not on it. I'm Dave. Um, the, uh, um, the reality is it, is it is difficult. It's a very competitive program, uh, but, but um, like I said, uh, 
if I were you, I would set up some time. And if you're serious about looking at the SBIR program or getting involved with it, sit down with your uh, local PTAC representative and have, have them help you walk through the program. Have you done any other uh, grant things like SPT? We've done, um, well, as part of the SBIR. Like I'm sorry. And a, like a national science foundation. Uh, we've been focused mainly on the SBIR, and for us, it's been mainly DOD, and even for us, it's been mainly U.S. Army TARDEC. Um, so it's, it's uh, we've got a, a real, um, pretty fortified connection in with that organization. And the, the nice thing about the SBIR program is once you're involved in it, and you're behind the walls there, working on topics and working on, on ideas, uh, boy, that opens up a lot of other opportunity because now you, as a business owner or as an individual can can offer up topic suggestions that are within your um, within your line of business so that puts you ahead of the game ahead of the competition so once you kind of break through that first time it's it's uh, it gets better and then there are other opportunities like the um, the Michigan SBTDC has things like the uh, um, MIETF grants that go along with the SBIR programs additional opportunities for funding for dollars for grants those are those are grants that help your business uh, get through the commercialization process yeah I mean we've been told about like the business accelerator fund type yep. uh, yes. but those are those are hard, difficult to get to there's a lot of people trying it's, it's hard to get those things. all right thanks thank you Thanks. 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 Hey guys, my name's uh, Steve. Um, this question is probably most relevant for Greg. Um, my co-founder and I recently graduated college. Um, we don't have a ton saved up, as you would imagine. Um, we did raise a little bit of grant funding. Um, I, I was just curious if you could talk about kind of um, maybe the first six months of getting um, to like first customer and kind of uh, how you hustled your way through that. Love that question. Yeah. You said you're Michigan, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, we had an apartment on the corner of Hill and Oakland. I drive by that house all the time. And my business partner and I lived in that apartment. We had restaurant jobs downtown Ann Arbor where we had the rules in place with our bosses that we would not work any lunches. We could only work dinners. And so those first six months, the little bit of money we raised was purely into the business. And we were trying to figure out what small bets we could make that would move things forward. And we were self-sufficient on our Make money as a waiter. Don't do the thing where everyone goes to the bar afterwards and spends all the money made as a waiter. Actually, you know, use it to pay rent, use pay for car, all that stuff. And uh, that was the initial six month sort of bid. And we were able to get first customers, spend a little bit of the money we had, and really start to see a little bit of traction. I, I was a waiter in Ann Arbor for the first 18 months of our business before I could finally go in there and say, all right, I, you know, I was appreciative of the opportunity I had, but it was time to move on to the next thing. If you ever want to talk outside of this, I'm happy to connect to Ann Arbor. Uh, the last piece on that was, you know, when I graduated from school, I got an engineering degree at Michigan. I had interviewed for some jobs, and none of them were very exciting to me at the time. I talked to my parents and said, I think I want to start this business. And my father, you know, a tremendous amount of credit, said, this is the absolute best thing that you can do at this point in your life. I, that's, at that point, I wasn't married, didn't have mortgage, didn't have car payment. It's like, you know, the worst thing that's going to happen, it won't work. You'll get a job somewhere, someone will interview you, and you'll tell them, hey, this is what I've been trying to do for the last year, and they'll respect that. But uh, I, that advice, I'm glad to hear you're doing what you're doing, and uh, I can help in any way I'd love you. Do we have any, any other questions for the panel? Uh, I saw one back here now. Okay. Uh, just one final note, uh, I wanted to thank you for coming, but I also wanted to mention that many of you received a giving card from DonorsChoose.org. Uh, that card has an allotment of $10 for you to give to any educational program listed on the Donors.org site. Uh, please find out more about redeeming those cards from before you leave here today. There will be volunteers at the registration desk to help you understand that process and, and the power of your $10 donation you can live. So, uh, with that, I'd like to conclude the panel and thank the panelists for coming and thank all of you for attending. Uh, sure, if you want to come up and ask personal questions, that would be more than happy. Yeah. Thank you.